Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Reselling. I am joined by my good friend, Lonnie. How you doing, man? Hey, doing great, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, can we get a microphone check and a video check? Let us know if everything's good. And uh, yeah, man, glad to join you for another uh, two uh, two weeks in a row. That's pretty good for us. Yeah, one more in a row that they're going to call it a streak. <laughs> Uh, let's say hi to some people in the chat. Bumcrack Picker was number one. Uh, good use goods. Jory was in here. Red Neckerson Resales. Tennessee Picker. Matt Payton. Nelly. Rod at Win by Doing. Jim Cooncat. Thank you for joining us, guys. Yeah. Uh, I tell you what, John. How about if I go ahead and get started with the featured YouTuber of the week? You want to do that? Yeah. Let's do it. Cool. Let me share. All right, and hang on, I'm, I'm going to get this eventually. Here we go. All right, so the featured uh, YouTuber of the week is actually brand new to YouTube. I don't normally do this, but David McMillan is a big supporter of all the reseller channels. Really nice dude, and he just started his YouTube channel up. Uh, he's got 41 subs right now. And he did a live stream today introducing his new channel and which I thought was strong, like for your first video ever to be a live stream. Yeah, that's, that's pretty daunting. strong. It's scary when you go live the first <laughs> time. Yeah, that's he came. He came strong. And it's really nice to put a face to a name. David is a great supporter of a lot of our channels and he's in the chat right now, too. So how you doing, David? Yeah, man. Good, good, good to see. You. And I'm so glad you're starting a YouTube channel. Uh, you're going to have a lot of fun with it. It's going to be a little nerve wracking, but David is in Northern Ireland. And uh, the main reason I wanted to feature his channel today is because this Saturday for him, I think Saturday morning at 8 a.m., he's going to be live streaming from a boot sale. <clears throat> That's really cool. Those boot sales intrigue me. If I ever make it overseas there, I'm definitely hitting up some boot sales. Yes, for sure. And uh, let's see. So it's going to be eight. I think you said 8 a.m. Um, 8 a.m. his time, and I think that, for me, I think that would be like midnight on Friday, Yeah, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, or 1 a.m. So it's like, isn't it a six or seven hour difference? Oh, no, wait, that's right, your central time. So, yeah, I guess for you it would be. I'm not, I'm really not sure, but, yeah, just go and, uh, like I did, let's see, let me move this out the way. Make sure you, you know, subscribe and then click the little bell to where it looks like it's ringing. And then you'll get notified whenever he goes live with his uh, with his live stream from the boot. I think it's going to be cool. So yeah. check him out, David McMillan. And the link is right down below, right? Yeah, link is in the uh, description of this video. Power Reselling, Corey says, boot sales are great, but so different to garage sales. I, I mean, it's kind of nice because you go to one spot and then you would just hit them, you know, like bang, 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 instead of driving all around town to – Yard sales. Let me know in the chat, Corey and David, anybody else in the UK, how many cars typically set up and sell at these boot sales? John, I've had this conversation with Nick before, Nick Hills, and you know, a few others there, because they talk about the boot sales. And it's kind of like it's a double-edged sword because on one hand, you have all the sellers right there in the field. You know, but on the other hand, you also have all the buyers in the same spot. And it's like really easy for them to all have access to the same stuff. Whereas yeah. when when you and I go around, we have to get out and drive around, hit garage sales. It's harder, but that also kind of um, filters out some of the people that aren't really hustling. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, I know what you're saying. So I don't know. I, I would love to try out a... a a boot sale though. That'd be fun. We actually have, I don't think they call it a boot sale, but there's something similar to that. They set up at a, a school nearby and people just pull up their cars and sell it right out of their truck of their cars. Pretty neat. Like a swap meet or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. The, the swap meet and flea market scene here where I live is not, not so hot, man. There's like one, one flea market kind of close and it kind of sucks. It's like a bunch of, uh, you know, they buy a bunch of Chinese stuff. There's a bunch of fake stuff. Oh, that uh, sucks. It's not a bunch of like just normal everyday people bringing their their used stuff from home to sell. It's all like like you know flippers like you and I. So it's kind of yeah. hard. 
it's not good. I know out west there are a lot of better ones than we have, though. We're lucky. We've got a pretty good number of uh, nice flea markets. Uh, there's a lot of resellers, but once you hit them enough, you kind of know when to go and where to look, and there's money to be made for sure. And I see uh, Good News Goods, Jory, is in the chat saying, uh, Lonnie, organize Louisiana's first boot sale. That'd be hilarious if I even called it a boot sale. People would be like, what the hell are you talking about, dude? <laughs> Rent an open area and charge $5 a car. And then, man, do you know that, like, I hear uh, Nick talk about this before. They'll actually charge, these, these boot sale promoters are pretty pretty sharp. They'll charge, like, a premium for the buyers to get in early. like Oh, you, yeah, yeah. I see church, extra, church sales do that here. Man, that's, I would pay it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no brainer. <laughs> I'm going to a uh, card show, like a memorabilia card show next Friday, and I'm going to pay $15 to get in an hour early because every time I go, there's stuff that's cheap that guys just want to get rid of and I make a killing on. Yeah, it's that's very smart of them to do. Yeah, I mean, it's worth it. All you got to do is find one, one, you know, not even a home run item, one decent item, and you mm -hmm. paid for your uh, little... Yep. Not to mention, I mean... Because I've done it at church sales too. There'll be a long line of people that don't want to pay that five bucks or ten bucks or whatever it is. So I've only I got a lot less competition. It's easy. I can take my time a little bit more, and uh, it's just not as stress induced. Look at the chat. I mean, it, it's pretty interesting. Like, like we a, a lot, most of us live in the United States here. I think in the chat, uh, but everybody does it different. Like. Rod, it went by doing. They charge to get into our flea market here. I would never have imagined that. Oh, yeah. Our flea markets charge. Yep. Like at, to go shop? <laughs> they call it a parking fee. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And Michelle Lathan is saying uh, they do that at the Rose Bowl sale. And uh, I think I think that uh, Steve and Steph have actually been to that live on their channel. Yeah. I think. Krillin, thanks for the super chat. He says, we have boot sales already called the flea market. Yeah, I'm just curious, though, because like at least my flea market, it's like 95% resellers. Right. I'm wondering if that's the case in the UK. They have. They also have, like, at our flea market, they have, like, the guys that have permanent booths, you know, like, under the roof. And then there's, like, outer spots where mm -hmm. people just, like, back their car up. Yeah. And pop their trunk or, or unload their van. And that's yeah. more like a boot sale kind of situation. Yeah. David, thanks for the super chat, man. He says thanks for subscribing, everybody. Lauren, uh, Lauren is stuck on me apparently. Oh uh, yeah, La Lauren, I, that's a pretty common thing to happen. It's my fault. I yeah. I clicked it for you for the uh, screen share, and then I did. Oh, I thought she meant like emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> I can't quit you, Lonnie. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Lauren. <laughs> oh my god. Uh. No, Lauren's cool. <laughs> Look, she's laughing. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Um, I guess I'm next. <clears throat> I found this story. I thought this was pretty cool. Oh, crap. I think I might have just clicked on an ad accidentally. Airman is sentenced for selling night vision goggles on eBay. This is the Dayton Daily News. Dayton. In Ohio, it's like 30 minutes north of me. The senior airman who stole night vision goggles and other equipment from Wright Patterson Air Force Base, that's in Dayton, uh, sold them on eBay, was sentenced Tuesday in the U.S. District Court. Uh, blah, blah, blah. He was sentenced three months in the community correctional facility, ordered to self surrender to the U.S. Marshals by noon. Um, it says July 20th. I hope this isn't an old story. No, it's a new one. Yeah, April 19th. They're giving him two months of surrender, which is kind of weird. So he has to pay restitution of almost $100,000. Um, replacement cost was close to $200,000. Yeah, pretty wild. I think there's actually a lot of stealing that goes on. Yeah. <laughs> but the, was, I, I, I mean, say. there's a record of it. You know, if you're going to sell that, don't put it on eBay, man. Like, you got to go to the black market with that stuff. Dude, whenever I got out, I realized that um, I think I was supposed to turn in my gas mask and a few other items. And uh, I'd never turned in that gas mask. And, uh, <laughs> I actually sold it. I sold it for like 80 bucks on eBay. That's not quite the same as yanking <laughs> some $200,000 night vision goggles. No, it's not. While you're it's actively not. serving. No, I would never have sold any or 
or like grab something out of a supply room and then right i promise that goes on a bunch. <coughs> that is crazy steven stuff resale killers are 151st people in the chat there hey guys glad you can make it <laughs> all righty uh okay i'll tell you what i'm gonna do one here john and can you pull up well yeah, would you pull up the uh, that Facebook page I had you put in the description? And I'll Man, talk. I knew you were going to make me do work. <laughs> All right. Yep. Yeah, here, I'll pull it up. You want the screen on you or me? Uh, it don't matter. You let it switch. Ask Lauren where she would like it to be. Let's do that. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, I guess actually it should be on you, huh? So, um, actually, this is a pretty good setup because, like, you put it on your screen. I'm talking, so I'm still down here. Hey, guys. So, that's kind of good. Um, so, we can't make it to – we were talking about the highway – what is it, 127 mm -hmm. sale? Well, we can't go to that one because of Candace's time off. But she actually has been looking at this one. This is a highway 70-yard sale in Tennessee. And it is June 7th through 9th. And we are definitely going to this sale. It starts in Memphis. And it's 200 miles. And it goes all the way up to uh, Nashville. So we are definitely going to that. If, if any of you guys are around that area and you'd like to get together, uh, I, you know, we're we'll gauge the interest if some people want to get together for drinks or dinner or whatever, you know, on one of those nights, um, I'm not sure where that would happen exactly at this point, then, uh, maybe we'll do a little, you know, informal meetup. It's not going to be any, any kind of official thing or anything like that, but I thought it'd be fun. Um, and yeah, we're going to go hit this thing. I would love to go. I'm not sure if I can yet or not. I got to, uh, talk with Whitney because we got some plans right around that same time. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make it down there. It'll be fun. Swamp Pickers in the chat, and that dude, he has been funny lately. He's been saying thanks for the tip. <laughs> <laughs> He's just needling away at you, getting he in is, your head. Thanks for he the is, tip. He is working on me. Hey, hello, Kathleen. I see KM Briggs 100 in the chat. Hey, Kathleen. Hey, Glenn. Um, instead of the exclamation points when you when you thank Lonnie for the tip. Put an ellipse. Put a dot 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 after each time you say that. Oh, I thought you. I thought you meant lips. You meant ellipses, like ellipses. Mm -hmm. Ellipses. Yeah, How do ellipse. you say that? I always said ellipse, but it could be ellipses. I think I an know. ellipse is like a shape, right? An eclipse is a circle. No, dude. I thought. No. An I'm googling it now. No, an ellipse is I'm a right. shape. Oh wait, ellipse. It's a shape. It's a shape, dude. I already know Curve this. Yeah, it is. All right. So ellipses is the dot dot dot. Yeah, you have to, it has to be plural. Oh. I see. Oh, so <laughs> it's ellipsis. S I S. All right. I'm not sure how you say it, to be honest. So yeah, I'm an idiot. Rod, Rod just gave you sugar. <laughs> oh, thanks for the sugar, Rod. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna be doing that. Um, and I'll post some details in the uh, our Facebook group. There's a link down below. If any of you guys are gonna be there. Uh, then we'd love to meet up with you. So, but if not, we're going to have fun anyway. We're going to go shopping and tooling around Tennessee. I love Tennessee anyway. I'm getting all kinds of smooches in the chat now. <laughs> like Mike, the crazy car, give you sugar. <laughs> um, I'm going to share a sale really quick. And I'm also going to promote our, Facebook group simultaneously. So I posted something in the Facebook group for this week in reselling earlier this week. I dug these clubs out of a dumpster. Um, these are ping irons, one and two iron. I probably wouldn't have pulled them out unless there were two of them. Individual irons don't really go for a lot unless they're like a wedge or something. Um, but I pulled them out, sold them for 15 bucks plus shipping. Sweet. So, you know, when I saw that post in Facebook, hang on, let me grab them.
Man, you remember, like, what? It's probably been two months ago, huh? Mm hmm. <laughs> Here they are. This is those, <laughs> this is the same exact ones. That's <laughs> Ping Zing 2. The same exact ones, except wow. I have a, like a complete set of them here. I picked these up for 20 bucks at a yard sale like two months ago, and I just put them in my storage. And I don't know, man. I, I don't know why. Do you ever get that? You don't ever get have that happen. Maybe somebody in the chat where you, you buy something and it just looks like kind of a pain in the ass a little bit. And you, I just kind of set it in the corner and I had a bunch of other stuff I could list anyway. And then two months later, it's springtime. It's prime time for golf clubs. I still got them. So, <laughs> I'm going to list these things after the show, though. I promise. Yeah. Um, have you ever sold a set of irons before? I've sold individuals like... <clears throat> Remember, uh, I sent you the photo from that thrift store. Mm -hmm. What was that? A Nike or something? Yeah, I can't remember. It's a pitching wedge or a lofting wedge. Yeah. So I'll give you a couple tips <laughs> if you're game for selling your irons. Okay, cool. All right. So lay them all out on the table. Okay. Um, and you want to line them up to where it's like, you know, three, sequential. four, five, six. Yes. Yeah, sequential order. And the length of the club should go down at a plane. If you've got one that's like randomly longer and than it should be, then that means somebody either cut something down or extended it and something goofy and it's going to throw off your sale. So make sure they're like the length that they should be. And since you have pings, they should have serial numbers on the nozzle where the head is on each club. And if you look at them, look at the serial number, and if they match on all of them, that's a good selling point for you on your listing. Say, you know, uh, matching serial numbers. Um, it looked like they were orange dot, so make sure you include that because that's the loft of the club. Ping's okay. the only, pretty much the only maker that does that. They change the loft by different uh, colors of the thing. Um, and then, yeah, you can like lay them out and kind of like stack them for the photo to where you can get them all in one shot. Okay, cool. And then let me ask you this: <clears throat> Whenever you go to ship them, like when I've shipped, I've shipped individual clubs quite a few times. Uh, whenever you get to ship these, like, well, you just dumpster dive a good box or you Franken box something up or what do you do? Yeah, I'm lucky. I've got a golf store like a mile from my warehouse. So I can, mm. I get boxes from them all the time. Yeah. If you've got a golf store and I mean, most of the time you just go in and say, Hey, you guys got an extra box for irons that I can have. Treasure vintage says, said a uh, hub said it's hosel, not nozzle. Oh, that he's probably right. Hosel. What is it? What part of the club is that again? It's like the head. So it's like where the head of the club meets the shaft, for lack of a better word. Easy. Yeah. All right. It's like that little spot there. Uh, you'll, yeah. you'll see where I'm talking about. There should be a serial number there. Okay. We're, we're talking golf clubs, right? Talking golf clubs. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. We don't want to get into unit talk like okay. Sunday night. No. Oh, I do have the. Uh... Which one is it? Is it this one? Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Oh, look, I see Rebel Scum and Joel Thorson in the chat. I see Rise and Grind Picker. Hey, guys, let's say hello to all these people. Can't say hello to everyone, but I'll try. Um, oh, so I'm going to show y'all something. Another pickup or a pickup that I got today without breaking it. This is something I've been buying lately, trying to find, is vintage computers. And, John, you've had, you had one similar to this. I have one on my website right now. Yeah, it's the Atari 800 XL. Okay. This is an Atari 800 without the XL. And to be honest, I don't know the difference between Does it take cartridges? Yeah, it does. You, like, you pop this up right here. And there's this shield, the glue oh, cool. came off or whatever. Oh, and nice. it take here and here, it takes cartridges. And, uh, it takes two cartridges? Yeah, it's got a left cartridge and a right cartridge slot. And I have no clue what exactly is going on with that. So it's going to take me a little, bit of re a little bit of research. But I do have cartridges, which is good. And then behind me, I also have a, have a floppy drive right here. And then I've got a tape drive over here too. And then I've got a box full of cables and software and books and all that stuff. So I picked all that up for, uh, for 60 bucks. Oh, rebel scum 
is in the chat. Uh, he's saying XL has a little more memory and one cartridge for basic and the other for game. Okay, I do have a basic cartridge in, in that box, an Atari basic cartridge. So, boom. Hello, Thrifty Treasures, Tanya. Glad you could make it here. So, oh, and 800 has four joystick ports. 800 XL has two joystick ports, according to Good Use Goods. Jory's probably got the owner's manual memorized for those two. Yeah. <laughs> that guy's video game knowledge just blows my mind. Like, I feel like I have a pretty good you know, grasp of video games and things. But then I hear him talking about it. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I don't know anything. It's dude. It's fun, man. Trying to get this, getting this old stuff that people don't really want anymore and, and firing it back up. I get like, I see why people buy a lot of this stuff that like most of the stuff I sell. I'm like, why would somebody want this crap? But then right. whenever, whenever I get into like vintage computers, then I'm like, okay, maybe I understand because I get that little warm glow, you know, that nostalgia and, I, and it takes me back to when I was like 11, 12, 13 years old and, you know, typing in these programs for magazines and running them. And you have no idea what it was like back then, John, it was crazy, but <laughs> it was fun. And it takes me back whenever I fool with stuff like this, it makes me feel young again. So I can understand why people buy a lot of this junk, you know? Yeah, everybody wants to relive their, you know, younger days. Yeah, hell yeah, getting old sucks. Tat Peddler is asking uh, if we've ever picked up a Dragon 32 computer. A Dragon 32? I've never even heard of it. Me neither. I'm guessing he's um, overseas because he's asking in the States if we've seen it. I never heard of it either. They have, you know, man, they have a lot of different computers than, than we do. Uh, here, like even back in the eighties, they were using like, the, like the Commodore 64 was like really hot here. I don't think it was that hot over there. Um, and there was another like really popular computer over there in the UK. I can't remember what it's called now. And it was almost non-existent here. Huh. So. Steven Step Resale Killers say, I remember playing with rocks. Good times. Oh, look, Jory Good Use Goods is saying Dragon was supposed to rival the ZX Spectrum. That's the one I was trying to think of. That that ZX, the Spectrum was huge over there. And I don't think there were very many of them here hmm. at all. So. Yeah, um, Tap Peddler is saying that it was compatible with the Tandy TRS-80. And you found those at yard sales before, haven't you? You found some Tandys? Yeah, I found two Tandy TRS 80s, but the uh, portable units, they're like, uh, yeah, they're like, they run on like double A batteries. I sold them each for like around 100, I think one for 120 and one for like 100 bucks, like a model 100 and a 102. Uh, and then recently I had a TI 99 4A I sold. And this stuff didn't go for big money. Now this one, if I can get it all up and running and the disk drive works and everything, I think I could be looking at, you know, in excess of $200 for this setup. So we'll see. Are you getting any interest on your uh, 800 XL yet? Um, let's find out. Let's go to the website and pull it up. And, and are you willing to ship this thing? Yeah, I'll ship it. We might have put it in the local auction, but yeah, I'll ship it if somebody wants to ship it. Silverhair Stacker is asking, is Commodore 64 still good to sell? Hell yeah, it is, man. It's just, I don't hardly see them. I saw two today. I probably should have picked them up. Are you serious? I hate yeah. you, man. Get me one, dude. I <laughs> What's want a good one. price to pay for one? I don't know. What were they asking? Or you don't even know, huh? It wasn't priced. It was, yeah. I was just getting a bunch of stuff. Um, okay. Ba -ba -ba -ba. All right. So, yeah, here's the one I've got. The cartridge loads on top. Um, I wish we would have taken a picture of the TV because it works. I plugged it in and it plays the chess game. Um, I had it in my uh, preview video that I put up Monday. It's got this joystick that's a little different. It's uh, Wico, Wico, Wico Command Control. Yeah, that was a very popular joystick back in the day. There were two aftermarket joysticks that I uh, had. One of them was a Wico stick, and they came in a lot of different models, and they were made to feel like they were made to kind of give you that arcade experience. Mm, okay. And so really, really high quality switches and, you know, buttons and everything versus 
the uh, the regular like Atari joysticks, they suck, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And then uh, the other one was Epix 500 XJ that I had. That was a very high quality stick too. And there's still a market for uh, both of those things. So, so how much should I pay for a Commodore 64? Oh man. Well, I don't know. It, that would be like uh, buying it and not knowing if it powers up or works or anything like that. Just as right. is condition. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't priced them lately, man. Um, hmm. Not sure. I know that I know they go like just the Commodore itself will go for probably over a hundred if it's okay. working, but I don't know what it'll do if it's not working. You got to kind of assume there's probably about a, it's probably a coin flip, whether it's going to work or not when you pick mm -hmm. it up. So, I mean, you could probably, if you could pick one up for 20 bucks, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You, you feel like you could probably do that or uh, maybe not that cheap, but I'll see. Let me know. <clears throat> yeah. Next time you're you're in. Next time you get in on one, let me know. Or I mean, hell, you probably want to run that on your auction. <laughs> um. All right. I think you might be up, bud. Okay. Um. Yeah. Rebel scum saying I hear the power supplies in the Commodores are suspect. They are. They are. And Rod was saying that there might be something missing. There it is, right there. I think I was blocking it. It's right there <laughs> where my finger is. You see that? Okay. I still and, need to find us a baseball trophy for the baseball league. And then Tanya said there's Tanya gave me like this Cajun 10 commandments. I need to hang it. So she was asking about that. I'm going to, next time we do the show, it will be hanging on the wall, Tanya. I promise you. <laughs> All right. Let's see what I have next. I'm trying to manipulate these windows. All righty. Okay. Um, oh, so I want to talk, I want to talk about something really strange that happened with a sale that I made a few days ago, John. Um, do you remember when I sold the 5d camera? Uh, I think I mm -hmm. sold it during the reseller six pack show. Yep. Okay. I sold a 5d, uh, Canon 5d camera with a charger. And then it also had the battery grip, which slides into the bottom and makes the camera bigger. And it also holds batteries. OK, and the guy messaged me. I shipped it on Monday at about 4 p.m., not too long before the post office closed. OK, and the guy messages me at like 630 in the morning on Wednesday morning. OK, and he says, hey, got the camera and the battery still waiting on the battery grip. Did you send it separately? And I very carefully, of course, it was a big, that 350 is a big sale for me. Mm -hmm. So I was very conscientious about packing it well and all that stuff. Right. So I was like freaking out at first. And then I was like, wait a second. It's he, and he's on the East coast. I was like, it's six 30 in the morning here. It's five 30 there. He hasn't gotten mail delivery today yet for sure. And I brought it late Monday. There's no way he got it Tuesday. No way. It was probably in transit on Tuesday. He doesn't even have it yet. I went and checked the tracking, John, and it hadn't been delivered, <laughs> just like I thought. And so I messaged the guy. I said, hey, did you perhaps order two cameras? Because the one, the stuff I sent you hasn't gotten there yet. Didn't hear from this dude for about three hours. And finally he goes, I just got it. It's all good. No further explanation. And then I checked the tracking again. It still was not delivered, and he told me everything was there, and it still had not been delivered. So then, about an hour later, I checked the tracking again, and then it scanned delivered. And he messaged me again, and he said, it's all good now. <laughs> and no explanation. No, I ordered two cameras, and I you know, mixed the orders up. None of that. He just gave up. So... What do you what do you think about this story? What do you think happened here? Seventy five percent of me thinks he was trying to scam and he he jumped the gun on it, but twenty five percent of me thinks he might have just ordered another one. But it, it's definitely shady for sure. There's so many shysters out there, man. I would, you know what, man? I would lean. I like. I would say there's a good chance that he ordered two. 
But if let's say you ordered two cameras, John, and then you got one of them and you opened it and it wasn't all there, that would probably be your first sign that, hey, maybe this ain't the right order that mm -hmm. I was thinking of. And then once you did like accuse a person of not sending everything and then you figure it out later, oh, I was looking at the wrong order. Wouldn't you be like, oh, I'm so sorry. It was, the, I ordered two, there would be an explanation forthcoming, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. Instead of just like, I'll forget about it. <clears throat> like, wouldn't you be like overly like kind of, dude, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. You know, I bet mm -hmm. I freaked you out, huh? Ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> None of that. It's all good. Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, the guy tried. He he pulled. He was trying to pull an incomplete order scam, in my opinion, and then probably get me to say, "Oh, here's a hundred bucks," or whatever. Yeah, you know, I didn't know where it was going to go from there, but he pulled the trigger. It was premature. So, I feel like I dodged a bullet on that one. I think you did. I was telling you about that uh, radar detector I sold. The guy sends me a picture of like this little nick on the screen. He's like, this is all scratched up, blah, blah, blah. Um, asking to return it. And I was like, okay, if you want to return it, return it. Like I was calling his bluff. And he's like, send me a return label. I'm like, that's not my responsibility to send you a return label. You know, it's items. Like, I'm not giving you one. Like return it if you want. And he's like, I'll just leave you bad feedback. Well, he just left me bad feedback. Today. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, so I sent him a message saying, uh, if you want to open an eBay case and return it, do it. And I'll call eBay tonight or tomorrow and say, look, I don't know what this guy wants me to do. Like I've, you know, I'm offering him the return. He, he didn't want to return it, but I, I would, I didn't think he was going to actually leave a feedback. Well, I, he's probably thinking I'll offer him some kind of partial or something if he'll take it down, but I'll just go over his head. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. You got to call eBay on that because like, and you t did you ever tell him, hey, just open? A he never opened a return, right? No, but just the way he's talking in the messages tells me that he knows what he's doing with this. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you can tell when people are, like, at least I can usually tell when people are sincere right. with the messages. You know what I mean? I do. And, and I hate, look, I'm not trying to, I, I, I'm talking about, we're talking about like one sale here. This is pretty rare. That's why I'm talking about it. Yeah, like, it is rare. You're right. Yeah, it's like one out of 100, if that. Uh, yeah, not even that much. So I'm not saying like everybody's a fraud, everybody's scamming. I'm just like sharing like the reason I'm sharing this one, it was a big sale for me. So I was especially sensitive. It wasn't a $20 item. Yeah. You know, it was a $350 item. And yours was pricey too. Yours was like 200 and something, wasn't it, John? Yep. So. Yeah, you got to call eBay, dude. And like, they may or may not take the feedback off, um, but it's worth a shot. I've had eBay take feedbacks off. You know, just kind of sweet talk them, man, and yep. get them on your side. They'll take the, they'll take it off, even if they're not supposed to sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes you'll run into a hard ass, and they won't do it. But it's worth a shot. And then you can hang up and call right back and get another one, and they'll do it. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's worth not a the shot. end of the world if I can't get it off. I mean, crap happens, you know. I mean, I'd like to get it off, obviously, but. But yeah, a negative, negative, uh, negative story with eBay. <laughs> that was mine. I feel kind of bad about that. I, I'm thinking about, I was thinking today about the eBay tattoo. Would you ever get eBay tattooed on your body? No, I'd never get anything tattooed on my body. <laughs> Not that anything is wrong with tattoos. I'm just not a tattoo guy. Whitney has tattoos. I've got I've got a couple of tattoos, but um, I was thinking today because I've been kind of joking around with Steve and Steph about you know the eBay tattoo I'm going to get and this and that, and I'm I'm thinking like where would I get that on my body? Where would I want to get eBay tattooed? And it, it would be awkward. And like, what about when I'm like 80 years old and eBay hasn't been around for you know 30 years? <laughs> and like people are like, what the hell is eBay? What the hell is that? Gramps on your saggy old tattoo. So I, I'm probably not going to do it. Thirsty Treasure says butt cheek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I got one, if I did get eBay tattooed on me, I would want a tramp stamp. <laughs> Steven Steph. That'd be hilarious. Put Oh, put it on your Google. Ooh, I wouldn't put it there. 
<laughs> I want to be able to show people though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, man. What's your next? Is it number? your turn? I think. Is it my turn? No, I just did mine. The camera. Oh, that's right. Okay. I gotta like do more work when it's on my channel. I gotta like click on, click on the things and lock them. All right. So, <clears throat> just found this story. I thought this was pretty cool. eBay now lets sellers autofill listings by scanning product barcodes. All right. So, what this is, it's in the app. Um, let's see. New function is now targeted to sellers to help autofill some listing information when a product's barcode is scanned. If you have the box for what you intend to sell, you'll be able to scan the barcode and then mark the condition of the item. Once eBay recognizes the product, it should fill in a basic description, stock photos, and suggest the starting price based on historical data and predictive analysis. So probably a really crappy starting price. <laughs> right. It does say, too, it says if you don't have access to an item's barcode, these same actions should be available by looking up and selecting a product by name. All of this auto-filled information is editable, so you're not stuck with what eBay suggests. Pretty cool. I mean, the you know, the... The description, I think, would really help with something that, you know, has, like, specs to where you're not having to, like, hunt and try to find what the actual specs of the items the item is. Yeah, sometimes it'll fill in, like, whenever you do video games and some other, some categories, it's actually done this for a while. Uh, whenever you're selling off a cell similar and somebody else has done, like, the UPC and they'll have, like, a stock photo ready to go. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And then it'll have like a little checkbox pre with, and it'll say like pre fill item specifics or whatever. Yeah. So this is kind of similar to that, I guess, for a, a broader so. range yeah. of categories. So it's cool, man. It's cool. Like anything they can do to make a listing easier is good for us. Yeah. Uh, I, obviously, you got to double check anything they put in there because if, anything they auto fill, like what if they get a spec wrong? Like if, if one of their specs is wrong, well, now you are wide open to an INAD. Right. Yeah. Because that's of that. Point. So you better get it. Make sure it's right. Or it might be some kind of like package thing that you didn't know was included in the, in the original box. You know, like in the box is like supposed to be some kind of cable or something. Uh -huh. And it might say that in the description includes blah, 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 USB cable and something else. You know, that's the only thing I would say is to be careful and make sure it's actually uh, complete to what that description is. But yeah, I mean, I like it overall. Anything to make it easier. Especially if they have like the weight. That'd be cool. You know, like the dimensions yeah. and weight. and. Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously they couldn't add for packing in the box and everything. But yeah, it would be that would be a nice thing because you can, put, you know, just automatically add whatever amount. Honestly, man, a lot of stuff now, I kind of feel like I've got a pretty good feel for up, <laughs> uh, up seven pounds. <laughs> I, no, I don't go that high, but like two pounds, I can usually figure out like if something could go first class and then I can figure out if something is between one and two pounds above that. I use a scale, mm -hmm. yeah, but I look like uh, who was that? Indiana Jones. When he's, when he's got the little sack of sand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they say like uh in the Indiana Jones movie that that was BS because if that monkey head or whatever that was on that pedestal thing if that was really solid gold he wouldn't have been able to lift it that easily. Mm -hmm. No. no. <laughs> he would have been like Ugh! <laughs> So. Oh, is it my turn? I, I'm trying turn. to sit I'm trying to sit here and watch the show. All right. Uh Bum, bum, bum. Oh, I got an email. Some of you uh, Amazon sellers, I, I'm an Am I have an Amazon FBA account. I don't currently actively sell there. Let me see. I need to pull this email up. Should have already had it done. But I got an email the other day that Amazon is actually uh, allowing time where you can recall items for free. Oh, here we go. It's uh, 
on March 1st, 2018, we announced changes to our monthly and long-term storage fees. So uh, usually when they, you know, these companies are changing fees, they aren't going down, they're going up. So uh, removing excess and aged inventory may help you reduce storage costs and improve your IPI. Therefore, starting today, April 18th, which would have been yesterday, for a limited time, they don't mention the end time, uh, FBA will waive your removal fees for any removal order that you submit for inventory that you have in our U.S. fulfillment centers. So that's a pretty big deal. So if you have some stale stuff at Amazon uh, in, in the warehouse, and if you do, you probably already knew. Um, and Carol's asking, Bargain Shopping is asking if she missed the Supreme Court online sales tax talk yet. You did not. That's the last thing we're going to do. Um Carol, so good question. But yeah, if you have a uh, excess inventory that's not that's stale and not going to sell, and you're going to have to pay long-term storage fees on that you want to get back, it's free right now. And I think it usually it's been a while. I think it usually costs like fifty cents to take this stuff out. And right now you can do it free. So, and dude, other than that, I've got nothing else today. Okay. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah. I've got the article pulled up. We'll go ahead and talk about this. Let's see here. There's plenty of articles about this. This has been a big story. I've seen it all over Facebook. Um, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, the Supreme Court met on Tuesday um, talking about these uh, online sales taxes. So this particular article says, Supreme Court divided on sales tax for online purchases. Uh, this was put out let's see Tuesday, I think it was. I think it was after they actually met. Uh, a closely divided Supreme Court struggled on Tuesday to decide whether internet retailers should have to collect sales tax in states where they have no physical presence. Brick and mortar businesses have long complained that they are disadvantaged by having to charge sales tax while many of their online competitors do not. States have said that they are missing out on tens of billions of dollars in annual revenue under a 1992 Supreme Court ruling that helped spur the rise of internet shopping. And that was, that was Quill versus North Dakota. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think it's South Dakota is the one that's kind of bringing this to a head now. <clears throat> Several justices expressed concerns about imposing crushing burdens on small businesses that sell goods on the Internet and about making them liable for back taxes. That would be very hairy. Uh, and then a, a few of the justices are saying that Congress should do something. Um, basically what I've gathered from a lot of this is Congress doesn't want to do anything. The Supreme court doesn't want to do anything, but I don't know. I don't know if something has to be done or not. From my understanding now, at least from the seller's perspective, you only charge sales tax for eBay sales to buyers in your state. Yeah. And no one else. And yeah, that's how it is right now. Um, uh, now, you remember recently, it hadn't been that long ago that Amazon started charging sales tax for orders that they fulfill, not for fulfilled by merchant type orders, but right. any orders that they fulfill themselves, you get charged sales tax on. And it has been that way for what, six months to a year or something like that? Yeah. Do they pay it to each state or each, you know? I guess. I don't know. Can't be, you know what I mean? Because sales tax is, it's not federal. It's all, it's pretty much. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I ran into an issue with this because I've had an affiliate, Amazon affiliate account with Amazon for years, like since 1990 something. And they shut it down a few years ago because Amazon wasn't collecting sales tax. So they shut Louisiana shut down my affiliate affiliate account or forced Amazon to do it. Hmm. And then I got it back later because Amazon starts charging sales tax. So, and I'll tell you the difference it makes, man, is that like, I just bought a Dymo label printer the other day and I was going to buy it on Amazon, but I noticed that by the time they added the sales tax in, it was going to take it up over $200. Oh man. And I was like, well, shit, I'm going to go look at eBay. So I went and looked at eBay and I found it for a similar price. No sales tax. I saved like 20 bucks. Yeah. Where do you think I bought it? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
KM Riggs says, I think the Supreme Court is passing into Congress. If nobody does anything, that will help us. If we have to figure out all the tax codes for states, you can imagine. I, I, I. Yeah, if it, if, if it does happen, let's say the Supreme Court decides there's going to be an internet sales tax, you know, either they would probably make a flat internet sales tax or they say you've got to, you know, charge it by state. If, you know, your buyers in uh, California, you got to charge them a California tax. Um, I'm sure sure that ebay would set it up to where it would be fairly seamless to where us the sellers don't have to calculate that you know it would just automatically be calculated and they would give us the report and say you know this is the taxes you have to pay you would think so and they would actually ebay would actually stand to profit because you know how we pay that final value fee on uh on shipping and everything Mm -hmm. you know, we pay a final value fee on the total price. Uh, if we started charging sales tax on all of our all of our sales, you think eBay would take the final value fee out of that sales tax too? Hell yeah, they would. Yep, <laughs> they would. eBay is going to get you know ten percent or whatever of the whole thing, and then they can use that money to set up their software, whatever the hell they got to do on their end to go ahead and collect and pay. Hopefully hopefully collect and pay the sales tax on our behalf. I would hope, please, because we don't need that. <laughs> um, a few people are in the chat are saying their states are sales tax free, Illinois and Delaware. Somebody said Florida. Are you guys talking about income, ta income tax, like state income tax? Are you talking about actual sales tax? There's no sales there, tax. There's quite a few states that don't have sales tax, John. Wow. I, yeah. I wasn't aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's, there's. I knew a, Florida there's didn't have an income, a state income tax, but no sales tax. I don't know about I don't know about sales tax with Florida. I thought they had one. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, somebody says no sales tax in New Hampshire. So yeah, I mean, if that happened, uh, you know, those states are going to have a big advantage for people buying it. You know, and and then a lot of times I know that like the states that ha don't have a sales tax, the way they get it, the way they fund a lot of their stuff, I think is they have higher property taxes. Okay. Yeah. So like our property taxes here in Louisiana are fairly low, but then our sales tax is like 10%, you know? Yeah. So by the time you you know do state sales tax and then, you know, like si the city portion and all that stuff, it, it's up around 10%. So Jory in the chat was saying that Canada, uh, they get 13% on the sale and then another 13% on shipping charge if it's not prime. And that's something where, you know, Canada, he gets, I think it's free healthcare. Or there's a few things that are free, but then, you know, they probably pay for that with sales tax. Yeah. And man, I can see, like, I can see the one side of it, like the small business, you know, cause they're, the way they're doing this, I, I think Amazon might be behind this because Amazon is at a competitive disadvantage based on that example I gave mm -hmm. a minute ago. Yep. If people are paying sales tax on Amazon, but they're not paying sales tax at eBay and Wayfair and all these other places, and you know, Walmart, you're pretty much going to pay sales tax at because they have a nexus to the physical stores and every everywhere. So that's not. But Amazon might be behind this. Amazon might be propping Wayfair up. You know, they might even be helping fund this. Uh, if you don't think Amazon has a strong lobby, <laughs> that, that's some big time money. But I mean, they're, but the, they're going to spin it like, and, and it is true to a certain extent, right? Uh, you're shutting Main Street down because people are, they have to collect sales tax. eBay does not. And Wayfair and all those guys. I mean, what do you think about that, John? I think you're right. Um, they very well could be behind it. Uh, there's so many layers to this thing. I mean, we, we could talk about this for hours. You know, I think, I think a lot more things are going to unfold from it. There's going to be a bigger fallout. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting. There's a lot of implications for sellers. Uh, it Goodies Good says no tax. Canada has no tax on food unless it's junk food like chips. How do they decide what's good food and bad food? That's get that horse crap out of here. In Ohio, there's no tax on food. There shouldn't be a tax on food. Like 
things that are like an absolute necessity like that. You know what I mean? Tennessee Picker saying Amazon has a lot of money but hasn't turned a profit yet. I think that's incorrect. I think they went a long time without turning a profit, but I was pretty sure they were profitable now. Let me see. Well, let me let's find out. I'm pretty sure they are. Maybe they aren't. Okay. No, I'm looking at a story right now. Uh, Amazon has posted a profit for 11 straight quarters. There's another story. It took Amazon 14 years to make as much prop net profit as it did. This is a story from February last quarter. So they're, they're, they're turning it up now. They, they're definitely profitable, but yeah, they went a long time without making any money at all. Hmm. Wow. And they're growing, but yeah, man, I don't know. That's uh. And it was bound to happen, right? Because there was a point, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, people, you know, during the fourth quarter, you know, they'd be like a cute little 5% of sales were done online for Christmas and stuff. And now how many people don't leave the house? I don't. Why, why would you? Yeah. So I don't know, man. Something's got to give though, because it's, it's not fair for the local businesses to have to compete against. But then again, they don't have to ship their stuff. And I don't know. Who knows, man? What, what do y'all think in the chat or the comments? What do, you, what do y'all think? Is there What is the solution to this? And um, do you think that eBay and you know of these other platforms are going to take care of it for us to where we don't have like a burden, extra burden on us? Uh, and it's going to be basically transparent to the sellers, which it, Shouldn't it be, John? Couldn't it be? Yeah, I would think so. Nevermore Antique says taxation is theft. Sales tax isn't the cause of small business going out of business. I agree with that. Yeah. But that's that's how they're going to pitch it, though. That They're going to pitch it as poor, poor little Main Street shutting down. I guarantee yep. you. Yep. They're going to show some scene of some little small mom and pop shops on Main Street, boarded up with a tumbleweed rolling by. <laughs> <laughs> you know it. You already know it. <laughs> so, That's all I got, man. I don't that, got that's anything. all I got, man. All right. Well, this was fun. Um, let's see. What do we have to plug? Is it is the six-pack show on uh, your channel Saturday? Yeah. I need or a Sunday, topic. Not Saturday, Sunday. I need a topic. <laughs> I got to think of yeah, a topic for that show. It ain't going to be this thing because I don't want to talk about sales tax while I'm drinking. Guarantee yeah. you. That's no fun. So, uh, yeah. It, oh, you're smiling. Dude. You got an evil smile. What did Whitney send you? No, it's not Whitney. It's the eBay guy uh, with that radar detector. Yeah. So he gives me the bad feedback. I just sent him the message during the show and said, if you want to return an open case in eBay, because his, his feedback says, uh, seller won't let me return it. That's what his feedback says. Okay. So he says, it's okay. I'll just keep it. Okay. So yeah, call eBay as soon as we get off this show. I'll, I'll give all up to you guys with that. Yeah. Let us know in the uh, Facebook group. So guys, thanks for watching. Um, go check out David's channel. Uh, he's going to be streaming Saturday morning, UK time and uh, check out our six pack show on Sunday night guys. Have a great afternoon. See you.